Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Del Sordo. Thank you for joining me on yet another Monday of today's talk with Erica. Thank you for subscribing to my YouTube channel and all of my audio podcast platforms. You can find everything in the info and about me sections on my YouTube channel, as well as all of the audio podcasts. So today I have Dawn Pino. She's a registered nurse for almost 20 years with an emphasis in leadership. She's a wife, mother, and has a passion for cars. She's the owner of Poison Ivy. Uh, Poison Ivy is what brought us together. And oh, not the itchy stuff you catch out in the woods. Poison Ivy is Dawn's beautiful 2011 Dodge Challenger SRT. For those of you who are listening to this podcast on the audio platforms, you might want to check out the YouTube video to see this spectacular car. So what brings us to a discussion on today's talk with Erica? Well, Dawn has contracted COVID and she's still battling the illness. So with school-aged children at home, this poses a threat to their start of new classes for a brand new year. Now, Dawn is here to tell us more about what this journey has been like. Welcome, Dawn. It's great to see you. Hi, Erica. <laughs> It's been oh, a little while. <laughs> it has been a little while. The last time we saw each other in person, we were at the car shows in downtown Hollywood with Cobra Joe Productions, and at, where I was the trophy girl, and you brought Poison Ivy, and we had a blast. And then COVID happened, and there are no car shows. I'm not sure if he started them back up. We can talk about that later. But then you go and get COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Dawn, what on earth, what has this been like? What, what initially, how did you get the symptoms? What did you know about this? And just bring us through the journey of what happened. Well, uh, even though I'm not at the bedside any longer as part of my nursing career, since I am in leadership, I mean, I still have to, you know, deal with patient complaints or go in their rooms, visit with them you know, round on them, or I can help out too, of course, if a nurse needs. But as far as direct patient care, I'm, I'm not at the bedside. I also, you know, have my nurses that are doing the direct patient care and uh, will sometimes come into my office. So not quite sure how exactly I got exposed or how I contracted this. Um, I mean, there was some exposures, of course, and you're at risk any, anywhere you go, but of course I'm at higher risk being in a hospital setting. So exactly how I got it, I can't honestly say that. Um, but it started with, well, there was one night on a Sunday night, the, the girls and I had, we had gone swimming. And then that night I was like really hot. And I just couldn't, I just figured that it was just a little bit too much sun because I did have a sunburn. And of course I'm, quite pale. So anytime I get a sunburn, it, you know, it affects me. So I took my temperature and it was a little bit high, but I didn't think anything of it. I just figured, yeah, a little mild case of too much sun exposure. So then I went about the week and I was feeling tired. I was just tired all the time, but it has been just a very stressful situation at work, you know, dealing with the, with the COVID patients and the, the whole entire situation. And then, uh, so I just kind of chalked it up to the job, uh, but I felt so sore, like I needed a massage. That's how sore I felt. And, but, you know, stress can do that to you and not enough rest. And just, again, you know, this is the whole entire work situation. So again, I really wasn't thinking anything of it. And then um, I, it was 4th of July weekend. And the reason I remember this is because uh, we were off on the, the, the Friday before, so it would have been July 3rd. Um, since we don't work holidays as leaders, we uh, celebrate the holiday the day before, or we basically have the day off the day before. So everything was fine. But then the next day, which would have been the 4th of July, I woke up with this sinus pressure and felt like I was coming down with a sinus infection, which I have had before. So again, didn't think anything of it. And um, I took some medicine for that, for that, for the, for the day and then for the next day, but it just like was not relieving it. And then when I had absolutely no taste and no smell, I thought, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> but I, I was still going with it. I'm thinking this is a sinus infection or please let it be a sinus infection anyway. But then the next, so that was Saturday and Sunday. So then Monday, I was, I needed to go to work um, and 
but I was like, I just, I don't feel good. I don't feel good at all. And I honestly contemplated calling in and I have, I've never called in, in the whole entire time I've been at this job, which has been, um, you know, a year and a half now. And I, I don't typically try to call into a job unless I'm really not feeling well, but I honestly was considering it that day. And it was like, well, but wait, you've got to go in. It's payroll Monday. You need to finish up some things. So I'm telling myself, all right, go in, finish up payroll, and then just let them know that you, you need to go home. And um, so I went in and I finished up payroll. And then I, I just, I had to go and speak to my boss and tell her, I, and tell her, I am not feeling well. This is what's happening. I took my temperature. It was 100.6. And so I went down to the ER, I got tested, and then I went home and basically started to self-quarantine in the event that this did come back positive. And it wasn't until the next day, so that would have been July 7th, um, like late in the night, like almost 11.30 at night, because you can um, log on to an app to, to wait for your results. And of course, I was you know, frantically waiting to know what these results were. And something said, go, go log in. And I did. And there they were. And it showed positive. And so for the next pretty much like 18 days was undescribable in the sense of, of everything you can experience with this. And I hear some similarities with other people that have gone through COVID. And then I, then I think I have some unique things, but I honestly felt like I was possessed with something in my body. Wow. And, and then it would start attacking the various different systems in the body. And when it was done with one system, it would move on to the next. So you hear quite commonly about the headaches and I, I had the pounding headaches and they would just come out of nowhere. Like I could be fine. And even maybe watching TV or, or something. And just out of nowhere, it would come on and it would be so bad that like, like my head felt like it was in a vice grip. So I was taking ibuprofen and ibuprofen to try and get rid of them. And then of course, you know, the fevers, the fevers were consistent. I was consistently running fevers, even with taking medications. And then, um, when it was kind of done with that, it would move to something else. There was, there was a couple days during this time period where my bones, my bones just hurt, like, like deep down bone pain. Hmm. And I would just be sitting or laying around. It's not like I was really able to physically do anything. And it was just pain, this deep seated pain in my bones. And then um, I got to the point where I didn't even, my body wasn't even recognizing to like have bodily functions. <laughs> I want to try and keep this wow. like yeah, not yeah. too medical, oh. but also not gross people out. But it's like, I realized after like 12 hours, like you haven't urinated. <laughs> it was like, I had to tell my body, you need to go to the restroom. It's like, I didn't have that sensation or that feeling to do that. And that's why I'm saying when it was done with one system of the body, it would move to the next. And, um, it, like, and even with like my skin, like I, it felt like my skin was, would be on fire and that something was crawling all over me, but there wasn't anything crawling on me. And I couldn't stand to have like anything touching me. Like, my hair is constantly up because I, I couldn't even stand to have my hair. At one point, I almost thought I was going to do the Britney Spears thing where she shaved all of her oh, hair off because my hair, my hair was even hurting. Oh, I know it, I, 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 it sounds crazy, but I don't know how else to describe it. It was just like my hair was hurting. I mean, there would be days where I couldn't even wash it because it hurt. And it wasn't that my, my head was hurting. It was my hair. Like you, I just couldn't even touch it. And, um, and then there was, you know, the, the coughing, of course, and then the whole respiratory issue. And as the symptoms started to finally fade and the fever that were breaking and such, I, um, I was so short of breath, so short of breath with doing anything. Um, 
like my house isn't that big. I mean, it's, you know, maybe 20, 2,800 square feet or something. I mean, I'm not really quite sure, but just for now, mind you, I was staying in the bedroom the entire time quarantine. The only time I would leave the bedroom is to go from there to outside to do my aerosol treatments because you can't, whenever you're COVID positive and you're doing the aerosol treatment and that medicine um, and, and the return CO2 is spewed out into the atmosphere, you don't want anybody around that because you don't know if there's any kind of particles in there that contains the COVID that you could potentially give to somebody. Mm -hmm. So I would literally go from just the bedroom to outside to do my aerosol treatments. And just that walk, I would get so short of breath. Wow. Even just taking a shower, I would come out of the shower and it would take me like 20 minutes to recoup from just merely taking a shower. Um, I, was, I was so short of breath. And I had been on steroids, the aerosol treatments, and you know, I was like, I don't understand this. So I had a cons consult with, now mind you, my pulmonologist has been following me and I saw a infectious disease doctor. And he's like, well, you're on all the regimen that you need to be on um, with, of course, what everybody hears about the, the popular remdesivir, but that's only if you're admitted to the hospital. Thank God. Um, I think symptom wise and partially, of course, being a nurse, I was able to manage all of this at home. In fact, I was kind of adamant that I was going to manage this at home mm -hmm. um, versus being hospitalized. But um, that was the only thing that I didn't receive was the remdesivir because I wasn't hospitalized and of course, convalescent plasma. Um, so when we spoke, he's like, you're on everything that you could possibly be on with the exception of that medication. And he's like, let's, let's do a six minute walk. And a six minute walk is where a patient will literally have to walk for six minutes or attempt to walk for six minutes without any oxygen to see if they need oxygen. And what would ha be happening is, is after I would have any kind of little activity, my heart rate would shoot up into the 120s and sustaining. And that's, wow. you know, that's not normal. Your a normal heart rate, um, you know, of course, varies between patients with age and sex and, and different comorbidities and things like that. Mm -hmm. But for me, my heart rate should be pretty much like 70 to 80. And um, with the virus in itself, it was sustaining in the 90s, but then with any activity, it would go up into the 120s and sustaining. And I'm like, this is not normal, of course. So I, uh, he had me do the six-minute walk, and after three minutes, I dropped to 77%. Well, a qualifying number is 88% for a person to have to need oxygen. So right there, I was already three minutes in and I was already at 77%. So um, I still kept going though, because honestly I wanted to know one, if I could do the whole entire walk and two, what I would be at. And I dropped to 66, 66, 67% okay. after six minutes, which is horrible, horrible. And at that point, honestly, I should have been in the hospital. Uh, we got oxygen and um, here I still remain with the oxygen. Um, I still get the shortness of breath, not quite as bad, of course, because I'm wearing the oxygen, but I still have to remain on oxygen 24 hours a day. Um, and you know, here we are with that. <laughs> Symptom wise, you could say I've pretty much recovered as far as like the various things that I was experiencing, you know, with the headaches, with the fevers, um, the, the pain and that kind of thing, but I still have this lingering respiratory issue. Um, and how long it will stay with me remains to be unseen. You know, even the doctors aren't sure. Um, so we just take it one day at a time, you know, moment by moment. Wow, that is quite the journey. So we're going into almost two months of you dealing with this. Correct. That You're a very strong woman. Let's start there. Um, very strong, but I was going to ask that also because you were talking a lot of in past tense, and so I was wondering what you're dealing with now, and so mainly it is still respiratory. Is it as bad or it's slightly better than what you were dealing with respiratory-wise? Well, no, there's de been definite, some definite improvement. When I first started on the continuous oxygen, I was at five liters, mm -hmm. um, which is the highest you can go 
on what what this is called as a nasal cannula. Okay. There's various different things that can administer oxygen. The nasal cannula, a simple face mask, a non-rebreather, um, BiPAP machines, and then all the way to the point of ventilation. So the max I could even receive is five liters on the nasal cannula. And of course, being able to manage that at home. <laughs> right. So right, she right. had me start out on the five liters. And after a little while, honestly, it was too much. Um, that was just, that was causing some pain in my head. Uh, it was almost like too much oxygen. So I have been able to kind of self wean <laughs> the mm -hmm, nurse mm -hmm. in me um, down to like three to four. It kind of depends on what I'm doing. If I'm sitting, it's three. If, it, if I'm having to get up to do something, it's four. I, I just really cannot tolerate the five. And also with that, you have to, um, the oxygen needs to be humidified. It needs to be moist. Otherwise, it will mm -hmm. completely dry you out, which will lead to some other couple complications, which I, mm -hmm. which I don't want to have. Um, and I don't know if you can hear my voice, but it's starting to sound different because after, if I talked for too long, I start to lose my voice as well. And even just having a longer conversation, I start to get winded. Um, you know, start, I start to have difficulty with the breathing as well. So yes, I have improved, but am I, of course, where I was at with my baseline? No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy that you're improving. You're going in the right direction. So hopefully it'll be gone completely very soon. I have more questions, of course, to ask you, but let's give your voice a break for a <laughs> moment because I do want to give some numbers. Now, I haven't given any COVID numbers for the, the U.S. Or, or locally Broward, Miami, Dade. Of course, I'm in North Florida, but the numbers are nowhere near what South Florida is dealing with. Now, when I first started this podcast, it was March 23rd was the first date I aired. And in Florida, there had only been about 1,100 cases, confirmed cases. At this point, I want to bring up that in Broward County, that 1,100 has moved into August up to 67,534. So there are a ton of cases out there. Deaths, of course, 1,049. That was significantly lower back in March. Um, Miami-Dade confirmed at 148,000, just astronomical compared to where you know, when I had started and when this really was brought about to the public back in March, beginning of March, um, deaths are at 2,166. But again, over 148,000 confirmed cases in Miami Day. That is insane. I do want to bring up the U.S. numbers. Um, I was surprised to see this because I have not paid attention to these numbers daily. Um, in the U.S., there are 5.6 million, over 5.6 million confirmed cases of COVID crazy. Uh, that is absolutely insane. Now, 1.9 million people have recovered, and the deaths that we're talking about are at 174,000 and over 600. So it, it's absolutely astronomical in the way that this has gone up. There have been many people who have recovered. Dawn, you're one of the strongest people that I know, and I've seen that. So I'm not surprised that you're doing well with everything that you have gone through, uh, honestly. That's that is quite the journey, and you've you know I've heard of what some people have gone through, um, but you've named certainly a few new things I had not known about. You know, scalp hurting. No one has said that yet. Um, I did not know that was a thing. So that's just crazy. No one's described that it attacks you know one part of the body and goes to the next part, and it's kind of doing its its own thing separately in the body. This is all news to not only myself but probably to most who are listening as well. I really thank you for sharing that. But I do want to, because we're at the start of school season, I know you get on Instagram and everyone's posting pictures of their kids going back to school. How's your family holding up? Your husband, your kids, did they, did they have to get tested? Are they going back to school? What's going on with your family? Well, when, when I initially came home that day and I started the self-quarantine, you know, everybody, of course, needed to stay away from me. My poor husband, he... Um, he, he blew up the air mattress that we have and put it in the, the living room and he slept on that. You know, the girls pretty much either stayed in the living room and watched TV or stayed in their rooms. And it was kind of like I would wave in passing. I was, I was going from the bedroom outside, you know, to do the aerosol treatments. Um, so that was very hard. Of course, they were scared. Of course, I was scared. Um, 
that I didn't want them to be to pick it up from me um, and especially George you know with his comorbidities and, and his health issues he's at great risk and such so you know I just prayed and prayed and prayed that they didn't get it and and you know thank the Lord that they didn't um, you know they, they tested negative and everything Good. Um, but and but let me tell you though the 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 thoughts of them getting it and the potential guilt you know from them possibly getting from me was just too much to even even try and fathom mm -hmm. but again mm -hmm. thank god they didn't get it um you know so uh, uh fortunately i guess you could say that this has happened during the summer so that they were home and that we weren't having to worry about school now, granted, they have been out of school and doing the virtual learning since March because they went out on spring break and then all of the, this happened. And because their spring break is earlier than public school because they go to a different school and they have a separate time frame than the regular public school. So they were actually out two weeks prior to when the other public schools were out. And so then, so they were on spring break and then they didn't go back the week that they were supposed to because that's when this all started. And then they ended up going to the virtual learning. So they've pretty much been doing the virtual learning since right after spring break. Um, <clears throat> so they've been home. So that's made me feel safer for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was waiting with bated breath as to what the decision was going to be as far as returning for the fall and when they announced that it's still going to continue at least right now for Miami-Dade um, for virtual until October I was like thank you thank you thank you um, because honestly we have in my opinion we haven't seen a large number of COVID cases in adolescents because they have not been in school mm -hmm. you know and we're not really taking them out in the public unless we absolutely have to necessarily do so because think about it again, this is my, my perspective, my opinion, but as the adults, we're the ones that have to, to go to the grocery store to get the groceries, you know, to feed them. Mm -hmm. Right. We're the ones that have to go to work, of course, to take care of the kids or, I mean, we, we're as the adults, we manage these things to, to take care of our children. Our children are not out there right now doing, doing this unless, you know, they're an older teenager and they have a part-time job or, or something. So I just feel that they, their exposures have been very minimal compared to adults and putting them back into school would have increased their mm -hmm. exposure. And that's why I don't think that the numbers um, or I, I feel that the numbers are where they're at right now with the adolescents because they have had less exposure. Mm -hmm. And if you put them back in a school setting right now, just during this high surge and exposing them, we will now see adolescent numbers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a week and a half ago or so, I had to take them for their yearly checkups. I mean, it's just, it's just a must. Um, and also, I wasn't sure what, what shots that they would need for school. So, of course, you know, I needed to take them. It's a requirement. And I wanted to ask, but I, I failed to, to see how many sick visits they're actually seeing. Because, you know, when school starts back up and they're like six weeks into it or so, you hear the kids, ah, I have the sniffle or I'm coughing or I don't feel well. Well, mm -hmm. Yes because you've been home for two and a half months or you've been doing whatever for two and a half months for summer. And now you're back in school. You're around all these different people. You're basically back around germs. You're mm -hmm. back around, you're in contact mm -hmm. with other things. So I just really wanted to know like what the sick visits have been like over the summer and since school has been out. But that's, that is just my, my take and my perspective on it that I, um, you put them back in a school setting and you're going to, of course, have their regular exposures that they would normally be getting, but now they're at increased risk and exposure for COVID. So I am honestly grateful right now that they are continuing at least until October to do the uh, virtual learning. Mm -hmm. Is it ideal? No, of course not. I've 
really feel that, you know, students learn best in person. Um, but for the safety of our children, mm-hmm. my children, I'm okay with this for right now. Yeah. And if anything, if, if they lag behind in something, you know, <laughs> there's always ways to get around it. You, you, you can always hire a tutor mm-hmm. or you do a little extra work with them or something. But mm-hmm. I would much rather have them here alive on this planet with me um, and not sick than, you know, getting an education in person, but then maybe dying from COVID. You know, yes, because in all yes. honesty, in all honesty, I have witnessed the COVID death. Um, I've lost a couple people from COVID. And I mean, I'm, I'm blessed that I'm still here. Yeah, I'm still fighting. I'm still struggling with this, but I'm still here. Mm-hmm. And I would much rather know that my children are safe for right now than them not being here. And I know not all parents mm-hmm. agree with that that they think that the children should be back in school. And that's okay. That's okay. You know, that's what I'm saying. This is my opinion. And this is my thoughts on it just from having kids, of course, and just being in the healthcare profession. You know, They might think differently numbers. after seeing and hearing what you have to say. They might think differently. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to think. Um, I don't know if, you know, those going back to school, I also don't know. I'd assume that they have to go back with masks. I'm not sure if that's thing um I, i'd assume well, because I, you have to wear masks everywhere now yes and you know that was one of, i think that one of the concerns for the elementary children is how would they be able to keep a mask on all day um you know because you know elementary kids they fidget kids. with things they they either right there i mean right. um i think it's more of a concern for the elementary children i mean of course thank goodness you know mine are older and and um I guess also a little bit of germaphobes, <laughs> thanks to me, and, and but just they understand the whole mm-hmm. situation. Yeah. Um, but the elementary children, I don't think they quite fully understand this whole situation. <clears throat> right. So, you know, they and they want to see their friends. They want to hug their friends. They want to play with this. They want to play with that. Um, so, w- no situation, honestly, is ideal. The ideal situation is that COVID would just freaking disappear already, and we'd mm-hmm. be done with it, you know? <laughs> Yeah, but I don't. I don't know when when the end will be in sight for that. Oh goodness, and I hope it's soon. But clearly, I'm nowhere near doctor status. You know, Uh, you're closer to that than me. But I have to say something because this is very interesting. You are the second household I've heard of where a parent has COVID, and there are children and uh, a spouse in the house, and they've not contracted COVID, which is fantastic. But that brings up questions, though, to myself and friends who I've spoken to, is COVID really that contagious? Now, naturally, you're sitting here with COVID. People are catching it all over. There have been deaths. What a stupid question, right? But honestly, you're in the same household as as your husband or two kids. Um, This same incident occurred with someone up here in North Florida. And I'm going, how do you live in the same house and not share that? which is great, but it brings up the whole, is it as contagious as everyone thinks? Of course. And I'm not sure how I can really honestly answer that. um, Because since we are basically, the healthcare profession is writing the textbook about this, this virus and it changes um, and something is different, you know, almost daily. Uh, I'm, I can't really say other than for me personally, the grace of God, <laughs> but um, they initially it was being viewed as somewhat of a like flu, mm-hmm. flu type virus. Um, and with the flu virus is, you know, you, of course, the best way to, uh, to prevent the spread of it is the hand washing mm-hmm. and keeping your distance from someone droplets droplets spew and fall three feet okay Okay. um so then you make that a little bit further and hence the whole social distancing piece of it will will help of course and how to prevent droplets from spewing of course would be doing the masking okay so not knowing so much about this virus you know some things were implemented 
by CDC and whatnot to help prevent it, okay? How we in our household have been able to manage them not getting it from me, again, first of all, I think the grace of God, and then secondly, recognizing it early and me going into self-quarantine, um, the day this happened, the, the girls like jumped into action and scrubbed everything down. Um, and I'm not sure. I really don't know how to answer that because yes, you would think that if you're in the same household with someone that they're going to get it. And I have known um, people that have got it and then it has been transmitted to people in their household. So I don't think that there are other than some common symptoms that are frequently hitting people that we are hearing about, especially like the fevers and the headaches and the cough and like the whole respiratory component of it. I don't think there's really any like solid norms to this virus. Mm -hmm. It affects everybody differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's kind of like writing, it's creating its own path. And I definitely think that it's, it has mutated, especially when we're hearing of different symptoms and the effects on the body and such. I think, uh, well, we all know viruses mutate. So how long it will keep up though? I don't know. <laughs> Again, hopefully it goes away soon. Dawn, thank you yeah. for sharing your journey. I know that you've got respiratory issues with this and you've joined me today to talk about this. I cannot thank you enough. You have been You've been a wonderful, wonderful interview. So many people had so many questions and are looking forward to seeing this. So I thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Do you want to add anything else before we go? Um, well, I mean, I'm not here to, you know, say to get into any kind of political thing because I'm far from political. I'm not here to, to argue whether this is real or is the, or this is not real, I just can say that I am living and breathing it. I um, I did contract it, and um, you know it's it has changed my life upside down. But there's always a positive in everything. Um, I'm grateful for the time that I've been able to at least be at home and see my family manage this at home versus being hospitalized. I'm grateful for the fact that I'm alive. I am not fully recovered, but I feel like I have, I am finishing conquering this. <laughs> what the long-term effects will be, I really don't know. Um, I'm praying that I'll be back to my baseline, that this will not be um, something that stays with me forever, meaning being having to be on supportive oxygen. Um, but yes, this is, this is definitely something that's out there. Um, and, and what has been portrayed by media and things like that, I, you know, I'm not here to say that it, it's more or it's less. Just know that I am one of, I am one of COVID. <laughs> so, so it's there. It's true. And it's real. And it sucks in plain English. <laughs> wow. I, it does. It, yeah. I mean, there is no better way to say it than yes, it does. It does absolutely suck. I mean, um, I'm a person that is go, 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 go. And I have not been able to go, 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 go. Um, even just simple tasks, trying to do minor housework, whether it's trying to cook or do a couple loads of laundry, anything is, is an effort. It is an effort. Um, yesterday I had to do, I did a couple loads of laundry and it, and it zaps my energy. I just, I feel tired all the time. I don't have the stamina. I don't have the endurance. And I'm not a nap person. <laughs> I, I don't nap. But yesterday I took a load of laundry out. I came back, finished it and folded it. I had to take a nap. And it was time for a nap. <laughs> and granted, it's understandable it was like, right now. <laughs> granted, it was only like a 20, 30 minute nap, but it was like, I, I, like, I couldn't keep my eyes open. And then I did another wow. load and the same thing. I had to take another nap. <laughs> but this is the frustrating part of it is yep. uh, you lose, 
you lose your independence because now I'm having to rely on people to help me in the sense of with these little things, which, mm -hmm. which to me just drives me nuts because mm -hmm. that it's not me. I'm very independent and I, I take care of things. I handle things myself. You know, I, I'm as part of being the mom, part of being the wife is you handle things. And now you've got to rely on your kids to help you or your husband to help you, which is okay. That should be normal. Right. But no, I completely me, understand. I'm the same way you want to do it. You want to do it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. So that's been the biggest struggle. And that's, where I'm at right now is just is trying to manage all that. So I hope that, um, you know, some of this information has been helpful for people so that they understand that it, it is there and um, but people are surviving. Yes, people are dying, whether they are dying because of it exactly or because they have an underlying comorbidity, um, you know, that's on an individual basis mm -hmm. and such. So. All right. Dawn, thank you. Thank you very much. You really have shared a whole lot. Thank you. Go rest, please. Yeah, I'll probably end up having a nap after this. <laughs> that is no problem. You deserve a nap. <laughs> Dawn, thank you very much. And one day soon, I will see you again with Poison Ivy. I promise. Absolutely. We'll yes. get together soon. Good but to see you again, Erica. It, I've really missed you. So. Hopefully oh. soon, yes. We'll be back together with the cars and everything. So I miss you too. I really do. Please tell your family I say hello. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye, Don. Thanks for listening to today's talk with Erica. Join me next week for another discussion with the experts who help make life easier. Please visit my website, ericadelsordo.com, where you'll find all of my social media platforms and more. And be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Once again, thanks for listening.